everyone, and welcome back for another deep dive. Today we're tackling a topic that can be tricky to untangle. Yeah, the overlap between non-stereotypical autism and OCD. These two conditions often share some super tricky symptoms. So figuring out what's what can be a real challenge, absolutely, especially in adults. Yeah, and you know, getting this diagnosis right, it's crucial mm. because the wrong diagnosis. It can lead to the wrong support. Exactly. And that can honestly make things tougher for people. That's so true. And, you know, it's fascinating. Both conditions can involve similar outward behaviors, things like, you know, repetitive actions, yeah. a strong preference for order, and even a real discomfort with the unexpected. It's like these two paths are running parallel, you know, at least on the surface, yeah. which makes it really tough to see the differences underneath. Okay, so let's paint a picture here. Mm -hmm. Imagine you're at a party. And you see someone super meticulously organizing the snacks. Like they're arranging chips and dip just so. Now, is this person doing that to stave off some anxious feeling? Like something terrible will happen if they don't? Or are they trying to like create this calming sense of order in a room that feels a bit too chaotic to them? That's exactly the kind of puzzle we're dealing with today. Right, because the behaviors might look similar, but the why behind them could be totally different. It can be completely different. So in OCD, those repetitive actions, they're often driven by a need to neutralize intrusive thoughts and yeah. reduce anxiety. It's like the cycle. Well, the know. thought pops up, the anxiety spikes, and boom, the compulsion kicks in. The compulsion kicks in to try to regain control. To try to regain control, but with autism, those same actions could be about something else entirely. Exactly. Yeah. For someone with autism arranging those snacks, it might be about creating a predictable sensory experience mm -hmm. in a world that can feel really overwhelming for them. Yeah. Or it could be about a really deep-seated need for routine mm. and structure to just feel safe and grounded. It's not about anxiety in the same way as OCD. Okay, this is making me think about masking, which we often hear about with non-stereotypical autism. Mm -hmm. Doesn't masking further complicate this whole picture? Masking is like being a chameleon constantly adapting to blend in. But imagine having to wear that camouflage day in and day out, never truly feeling like you can be yourself. The emotional toll can be immense. Yeah. And here's the thing. Those learned behaviors, the rigidity, the perfectionism, the fear of making a mistake, they can look a lot like OCD, making it even trickier to spot the underlying autism. It's almost like they're inadvertently mimicking OCD, Precisely. which makes it even harder to see the bigger picture. Yeah. And if those mass behaviors are mistaken for solely OCD, it can lead to the wrong kind of help. It's like trying to treat a headache when the real problem is a toothache. Okay. The relief might be temporary, but it won't address the root cause. So we've got these outward behaviors that can look similar but they come from very different internal experiences. How do we even begin to untangle this knot? We need to go beyond just observing the behavior Yeah. and dig into those core features that define each condition. So let's start with OCD. Okay. At its heart, OCD is all about those intrusive thoughts, the obsessions that trigger anxiety, and then come the compulsions, the repetitive actions or mental rituals mm -hmm. that are attempts to neutralize those thoughts and regain a sense of control. So it's like this loop, intrusive thought sparks anxiety, leads to the compulsion yes. to relieve that anxiety. But in autism, those repetitive behaviors, they might not be driven by anxiety at all. Right. It's a totally different driver. Think of it this way for someone with autism. Yeah. Those behaviors might be serving a different purpose. It could be about sensory input. Maybe the feel of a certain fabric is calming. Or the sound of a specific routine provides comfort. It could be about self-regulation, a way to manage overwhelming emotions or sensory overload. Or it might simply be about finding a sense of predictability in a world that can feel chaotic. So the same outward behavior, like arranging objects in a specific order, can... could be stemming from completely different internal experiences. Exactly. So that's why understanding those internal drivers, those core features of each condition, is key to getting the diagnosis right. Absolutely. And there's another layer to this flexibility. Okay. Now, both OCD and autism can involve rigid thinking. But again, it's the why that's crucial. So someone with OCD, they might need things done in a precise way to manage their anxiety, but someone with autism might crave predictability because change can feel overwhelming. You got it. It's a subtle but important difference. For someone with OCD, the need for control can feel like a lifeline, a way to keep those anxious thoughts at bay. But with autism, it's often about creating a sense of stability in a world that can feel unpredictable and overwhelming. 
It's not necessarily about controlled in the same way, but more about creating a sense of safety and predictability. This is all really helpful in understanding the key differences. But I'm guessing things aren't always so clear-cut in real life. You're absolutely right. Every individual is unique. And these conditions can present in a myriad of ways. The way these conditions manifest can vary widely from person to person. And often it's not just one or the other. Sometimes it's both. So it's not always black and white. There can be shades of gray. And sometimes those shades can be pretty subtle. Exactly. And that's why this conversation is so important. The more we understand about these nuances, the better equipped we are to advocate for ourselves and others who might be struggling to get the right diagnosis and support. We'll delve deeper into those challenges in just a bit. Before we move on, I want to bring up something that might be on everyone's mind. Okay. How does masking specifically impact diagnosis? I mean, if someone is masking their autistic traits, wouldn't that make it even harder to recognize the underlying autism? You're hitting on a really critical point. Remember, masking is all about adapting to fit in which often means suppressing those natural autistic tendencies. Right. This could look like forcing eye contact even though it's uncomfortable, scripting conversations to appear more socially adept, or even developing rigid routines, and striving for perfection to avoid any perceived mistakes. So they're essentially creating a persona, a mask, to navigate the world, but at what cost? Exactly. Masking can be incredibly draining. Yeah. Both mentally and emotionally. Yeah. It's like constantly performing a role. Yeah. Never truly feeling like you can be yourself. And here's where the diagnostic dilemma really kicks in. Those learned behaviors of this rigidity, the perfectionism, the fear of failure mm. can so closely resemble the outward symptoms of OCD. It's like they're inadvertently mimicking OCD, which makes it even harder to see the underlying autism. It's like trying to diagnose a chameleon based on the color it's currently displaying. That's such a great way to put it. Without realizing, it can change colors at any moment. Right. If clinicians aren't aware of the complexities of masking, they might misinterpret those behaviors as solely OCD hmm. and miss the bigger picture. That's why it's so crucial for clinicians to consider the individual's entire history, to look for those underlying autistic traits that might be hidden beneath the surface of those masked behaviors. It's like they need to be detectives, piecing together clues from the person's past and present to see the full picture. And that's where things get really personal, right? Absolutely. It's about understanding the individual's unique experiences, not just focusing on a checklist of symptoms. It's about seeing the person behind the mask, listening to their story, and recognizing the subtle ways autism might be manifesting in their lives. And this is where we as deep divers can play a role. The more we understand about these nuances, the better equipped we are to advocate for ourselves or others who might be struggling with misdiagnosis. So it's a call for greater awareness. Exactly. Both among clinicians and the general public yeah. about the complexities of masking and how it can blur the lines between these conditions. We're not just passively absorbing information here. We're using it to make a difference in how these conditions are understood and treated. And that difference can have a huge impact on people's lives. Speaking of impact, let's talk about why getting the diagnosis right is so crucial. Yeah. It's not just about a label. It's about unlocking the right path to support and well-being. After all, wouldn't you want the right map if you were setting off on a journey? That's a great point. We've explored these tricky similarities and the impact of masking. But what are the real-world consequences? When someone gets misdiagnosed, what happens when autism is mistaken for OCD or vice versa? Well, imagine you're trying to build a house but you've been given the wrong blueprints. Mm -hmm. You might end up with a structure. That just doesn't make sense. That's what it's like to receive the wrong treatment for a complex mental health condition. It's like trying to unlock a door with the wrong key. Okay. You might be able to jiggle it around, but you won't be able to truly open it. So someone with undiagnosed autism who's been labeled with OCD and treated accordingly, they might not be getting the help they need to address their social communication challenges. Well or sensory sensitivities. Precisely, and they might be subjected to therapies that are designed to address obsessions and compulsions, but which might not be helpful or could even be counterproductive for their underlying autism. It's like trying to fit a square peg into a round hole, it just doesn't work. And on the flip side, someone misdiagnosed with OCD might be missing out on therapies. Exactly, that could help them manage their anxiety and intrusive thoughts. Misdiagnosis can lead to ineffective therapies, missed opportunities for appropriate support, and a whole lot of frustration and confusion for the individual. And beyond the ineffective treatment, there's also the impact on self-understanding. That's a big one, right? Imagine finally getting the right diagnosis, having that aha moment, 
where so many things suddenly make sense. It could be incredibly validating, like finally seeing yourself reflected in the mirror clearly. Yeah. It allows individuals to understand themselves better, to make sense of their experiences, and to access the right support and resources. It's about empowering the individual to live a full and meaningful life, embracing their neurodiversity and finding their own path to success. It's not just about treating the symptoms, it's about giving someone the tools and the map yeah. to navigate their own unique journey. And this is where you, the listener, come in. We're not just talking about abstract concepts here. We're talking about real people, yeah. real lives, real challenges. The more we, as a society, understand about these nuances, the more we can create a culture of acceptance and support for individuals with autism and OCD. So it's a call to action to educate ourselves, to question assumptions, and to advocate for greater understanding and support. But before we delve deeper into what that support can look like, let's hear from our listeners. We've got some great questions coming in. I'm eager to hear what our deep divers are curious about. Let's dive into those questions. Okay, let's do it. All right, we've got a great question here from a listener who says, I've been diagnosed with OCD, but I'm starting to wonder if I might also have autism. How can you bring this up with my therapist without feeling like I'm questioning their judgment? That's a great question. What advice would you give to someone in that situation? It's wonderful that this listener is tuning into their own experience and mm -hmm. advocating for themselves. Yes. It's important to remember, you always have the right to explore your concerns and to seek a second opinion if needed. Absolutely. It's your journey, and you deserve to feel confident in your diagnosis. When it comes to bringing this up with your therapist, I would suggest approaching it from a place of curiosity and collaboration. Okay. You could say something like, I've been doing some research and I'm noticing some similarities between autism and my experiences. I'm curious to explore this further and understand if it might be relevant to my diagnosis. So it's about framing it as a collaborative exploration. Exactly. Rather than a challenge to their expertise, a good therapist will welcome your questions and be open to exploring all possibilities. Remember, they are there to support you on your journey of self-discovery. That's such a great point. It's a partnership, not a dictatorship. Okay, we have another listener who asks, my child has been diagnosed with autism and I'm feeling overwhelmed. What are some practical steps I can take to support them and create a more autism-friendly environment at home? It's completely understandable for parents to feel overwhelmed, especially when they're first navigating the world of autism. Yeah. It's a lot to take in. I think the first step is to remember, you're not alone. There's a wealth of resources and support available. Connect with other parents of autistic children join support groups, and access information from reputable organizations like Autism Speaks or the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. These connections, they can provide a lifeline of shared experiences and practical advice. It's like finding your tribe. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Those people who truly get it. When it comes to creating an autism-friendly home environment, focus on predictability and structure. Okay. Think of it like creating a haven where your child can feel safe and understood Establish clear routines, provide visual supports like schedules and checklists, and create sensory-friendly spaces where your child can retreat when they feel overwhelmed. So it's about creating a sense of stability and predictability. Precisely. To help them navigate a world yeah. that can often feel chaotic. And remember, this is a journey, not a race. There will be ups and downs. But with patience, understanding, and a supportive community, you can help your child thrive. We've got time for one more question. This listener says, I'm an adult who's recently been diagnosed with autism. I'm feeling a mix of relief and overwhelm. What advice would you give to someone just starting out on this journey of self-discovery? First, congratulations on taking this important step towards self-understanding. It's normal to feel a mix of emotions, but remember, this is a positive development. You're now equipped with valuable knowledge. That can help you navigate the world more effectively and connect with others who share your experiences. Embrace your neurodiversity. Connect with the autistic community online or in person and celebrate your unique strengths and perspectives. This is a journey of self-discovery and it's full of possibilities. It's like you've been handed a new map, a new set of tools to navigate the world. Exactly, in a way that feels authentic and empowering. There's no right or wrong way to be autistic. Embrace your journey, celebrate your individuality, and never stop learning and growing. And remember, finding the right support is essential, especially for adults who may have spent years feeling misunderstood or mislabeled. Let's talk more about that support piece, because getting a diagnosis is one thing, but knowing what to do next can feel overwhelming. You're right. It's like finally finding the right trailhead, but then realizing you need the right gear 
to navigate the terrain. I love that analogy. So what kind of gear should people be looking for? Well, firstly, I want to emphasize that support looks different for everyone. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. Right. It's about finding what resonates with the individual mm. and their specific needs. So it's about creating a personalized toolkit. Precisely. Tailored to their unique strengths and challenges. And that toolkit can include a wide range of resources, from therapy and medication to lifestyle adjustments and community connections. It's about building a multifaceted approach that addresses their needs holistically. Let's break that down a bit, starting with therapy. What are some therapeutic approaches that have been shown to be effective for both non-stereotypical autism and OCD? For autism therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT can be incredibly helpful. Oh. CBT focuses on identifying and changing unhelpful thought patterns and behaviors that might be contributing to anxiety or social difficulties. It's about equipping individuals with practical strategies to navigate those challenges with greater confidence and ease. So it's like learning a new set of tools. Exactly. To manage those tricky situations. Yes. And speech and language therapy can be invaluable for addressing communication challenges, while occupational therapy can assist with sensory processing issues right. and developing essential life skills. It's about building those foundational skills yeah. that are essential for navigating the world with greater independence and confidence. Now for OCD, CBT is also highly effective, particularly a specialized form called exposure and response prevention or ERP. Think of it like a gradual desensitization process. ERP involves gradually exposing individuals to their triggers, those things that spark their anxiety, while teaching them to resist the urge to engage in those compulsions that are meant to quell the anxiety. So it's about breaking that cycle of anxiety and compulsion. Exactly. Helping them to realize yeah. that they can tolerate the discomfort mm -hmm. and that the feared outcome isn't going to happen. It's about reclaiming their power and realizing that they don't have to be ruled by their anxiety. And in some cases, medication might also be recommended to help manage anxiety or depression that often accompany these conditions. Right, because sometimes those co-occurring conditions can make things feel even more overwhelming. Absolutely. Now let's move beyond therapy and medication. There's a whole realm of lifestyle adjustments that can make a world of difference. Okay, let's talk about that. What kind of lifestyle tweaks can be helpful for people with autism and OCD? Well, for individuals with autism, Creating a structured and predictable environment mm. can be incredibly grounding and calming. This might involve establishing clear routines, using visual schedules to help them anticipate what's coming next, and minimizing sensory overload by creating quiet spaces or using noise-canceling headphones. So it's about creating a sense of order and predictability. Exactly. In a world that can often feel chaotic and overwhelming, like building a safe haven, where they can recharge and feel at ease. And for those with OCD, it's important to find healthy ways to manage anxiety and stress. Yes, that's so important. This could look like incorporating mindfulness practices into their daily routine, engaging in regular exercise, or carving out time for hobbies that bring joy and relaxation. It's about finding those self-care practices yeah. that nourish the mind and body and help to build resilience in the face of challenges. And let's not forget the power of community. That's such a crucial piece. Connecting with others who understand your experiences can be incredibly validating and supportive. Yeah, whether it's online forums, in-person support groups, or even casual meetups, finding your tribe, those people who get it, can make all the difference. It's like having a cheerleading squad on your journey. Exactly, those people who celebrate your wins and offer a hand up when you stumble. And this is where self-advocacy comes back into play. It's about knowing your needs, communicating those needs effectively to others, and seeking out the resources and support that will empower you to thrive. It's about taking ownership of your journey and being an active participant in your own well-being. So it's not about passively waiting for things to get better. Well, it's about actively shaping your experience and seeking out the support that will help you flourish. But before we jump into the final part of our deep dive, I want to take a moment to address something that I, often gets overlooked. The incredible strengths and talents well, yes. that often accompany autism and OCD. It's so important to shift our focus from simply seeing challenges to recognizing the unique gifts that these individuals bring to the world. They're not defined by their diagnoses, but rather their diagnoses are just one facet of their multifaceted selves. Right, it's about seeing the whole person, not just the diagnosis. So let's talk about some of those strengths. I know many autistic individuals possess exceptional attention to detail, a strong sense of justice, and a unique way of seeing the world. That can lead to incredible creativity and innovation. Absolutely, they often think outside the box, question assumptions, 
and see patterns that others might miss. And those with OCD often have remarkable perseverance, a strong work ethic, and an unwavering commitment to their values. They're often incredibly detail-oriented, organized, and driven to achieve their goals. So it's about recognizing that these conditions are not simply deficits, but different ways of being, ways of thinking, ways of experiencing the world that can enrich our lives in countless ways. Beautifully said. It's about embracing neurodiversity in all its forms uh -huh. and celebrating the contributions of individuals who think differently. And as we move into the final part of our deep dive, I hope you'll keep that in mind, because while we've been talking about challenges and support, it's essential to remember that these individuals have so much to offer the world. That's a perfect segue into the final part of our conversation, where we'll be exploring strategies for thriving and living a full and meaningful life with autism and OCD. Stay tuned, deep divers, we're just getting started. All right, we're back for the final part of our deep dive into non-stereotypical autism and OCD. We've covered a lot of ground right. from untangling those overlapping symptoms and the impact of masking to the importance of accurate diagnosis and the different support systems available. But now, let's shift our focus to something truly empowering, strategies for thriving and living a full and meaningful life with these conditions. Yes, it's wonderful to be focusing on the positive side of things. We've talked about the challenges, but it's crucial to remember that people with autism and OCD have so much to offer the world. They're not defined by their diagnoses, but rather their diagnoses are just one facet of their multifaceted selves. I love that perspective. It's about recognizing the whole person, not just the diagnosis. No. So as we delve into these strategies for thriving, let's keep in mind that these are individuals with unique strengths, talents, and perspectives that enrich our world in countless ways. Absolutely. And when we talk about thriving, it's important to remember that it's not about fixing or curing these conditions. It's about empowering individuals to embrace their neurodiversity, navigate the world in a way that feels authentic and meaningful to them, and live their lives to the fullest. So it's about celebrating their differences. Precisely. And supporting them in finding their own unique path mm -hmm. to happiness and fulfillment. And a path might look different for everyone. What works for one person might not work for another. Right. It's about personalizing support and finding the strategies mm -hmm. that best fit their individual needs and preferences. Okay, so let's talk about some of those strategies. What are some practical steps people can take to create a life that feels supportive and empowering? Well, it's helpful to think about support as a multifaceted approach. It's not just about therapy or medication, although those can be important components. It's also about creating a supportive environment, building strong connections, and finding activities and passions that bring joy and meaning. So it's like building a toolbox. That's a great analogy, filled with a variety of tools that they can use to navigate the challenges and celebrate the triumphs yeah. of their unique journey. And just like any toolbox, the contents will vary depending on the individual's needs. But let's talk about some of the essential tools. That might be helpful. Okay, let's start with the environment. How can people create a space that feels supportive and reduces anxiety? For many individuals with autism, predictability and structure are key. Okay creating a consistent routine, using visual aids like schedules and checklists, and minimizing sensory overload by creating quiet spaces, or using noise-canceling headphones can make a world of difference. So it's about creating a sense of stability and order. Exactly. In a world that can often feel chaotic and overwhelming, like building a haven where they can recharge and feel safe. And for those with OCD, it's helpful to focus on creating a space that feels calm and organized. Yes, clutter and disarray can often exacerbate anxiety. Mm -hmm. So creating a system for keeping things tidy and in their place can be incredibly helpful. So it's about finding those environmental tweaks that reduce stress and create a sense of peace and control. What about connections and relationships? How can people build supportive relationships that foster a sense of belonging and understanding? This is such a vital part of thriving for both autism and OCD. Yeah. Finding your tribe, those people who truly get it. Yeah can be incredibly validating and empowering. This could involve connecting with other individuals with these conditions through support groups, online forums, or even casual meetups. It's like finding your cheerleading squad. Precisely. Those people who celebrate your wins and offer a hand up when you stumble. And for family and friends. Of individuals with autism and OCD, education and empathy are key. Take the time to learn about these conditions, understand their loved ones' unique challenges and strengths, and practice patience and compassion. 
So it's about building bridges of understanding. Exactly. Yeah. And creating a network of support that extends beyond the individual themselves. Now let's move on to something that often brings immense joy and fulfillment to individuals with autism and OCD, finding passions and pursuing interests. Ah, oh, yes. This is where those unique strengths and talents can really shine. Absolutely. Many individuals with autism have deep-seated passions and interests that they can hyper-focus on for hours on end, encourage those interests, provide opportunities for them to explore those passions, and celebrate their achievements in those areas. So it's about nurturing those interests. Exactly, and allowing them to dive deep into the things that bring them joy and okay. ignite their curiosity. And for those with OCD, finding activities that promote relaxation and mindfulness can be incredibly helpful in managing anxiety. That's so true. This might involve practicing yoga, meditation, or spending time in nature. So it's about finding those activities. Precisely. That helped them to connect with the present moment and quiet those anxious thoughts. And lastly, I want to emphasize the importance of self-advocacy. Yeah, self-advocacy is crucial. This involves understanding your needs, communicating those needs effectively to others, and seeking out the resources and support. That will empower you to thrive. So it's not about passively waiting for things to get better. Exactly. It's about actively shaping your experience and seeking out the support that will help you flourish. And remember, self-advocacy is a journey, not a destination. It's a skill that develops over time with practice and perseverance. And as we wrap up this deep dive, I want to leave our listeners with a final thought. While we've been focusing on strategies for thriving with autism and OCD, it's crucial to remember that these conditions are not simply diagnoses, they are part of a tapestry. Beautifully said. Of human experience, a spectrum of neurodiversity that enriches our world in countless ways. So let's celebrate those differences, foster a culture of understanding and acceptance, and continue to advocate for a world where everyone, regardless of their neurology, can thrive and reach their full potential. And remember, you're not alone on this journey. There's a whole community out there mm -hmm. ready to support you, to celebrate your strengths, and to help you navigate the challenges and triumphs of life with autism and OCD. Until next time, deep divers, happy exploring.